and friends to our Beyond Books and Bursaries gathering with our friends from Zambia, uh, Lumba and Shadrick. Folks are still gathering, but I think I think we'll begin. Um, many of you are familiar with uh, Zoom, and so throughout the session, um, if you're muted, but if you later in the session you want to ask a question, you can raise your hand or put a message in the chat, and uh, you can speak and ask a question. Um, in the meantime, you can have your video on or have your video off. The, the event is being recorded so others can view. So if you prefer your video not to be shown, then you can turn that off. And um, we have a great gathering here. And so I'd like to pass it over to um, our, our friend, um, Karen Sunarin, who is the major gifts uh, leader in the philanthropy at the United Church of Canada. So I'd like to invite her to, to start us off with a prayer and a land acknowledgement. Good morning, everyone. My name is Karen Sunarine, as Laurie said, and I'm the mission advancement lead at the philanthropy team in the United Church General Council office. And I'm going to be reading the land acknowledgement uh, from a specific one that I've researched that'll be specifically to the area where I live. But um, at any time, you could put in the chat area, um, your area that you live if you know your treaty. So. On October 29th, 1818, the Crown signed Treaty 19, the Agentis Treaty, with leaders from the Mississauga's First Nation. Those leaders were Agentis, Chief of the Eagle Tribe, Wigashigalman of the Eagle Tribe, Kabakatakubi on the Ottawa Otter Tribe, Kababoniki on the Otter Tribe, and Pagtani Kowato Ibi on the Otter Tribe. In a treaty of only 375, sorry, 378 words, those leaders sold 648,000 acres of land for goods paid annually worth 522 euros and 10 cents. That land today encompasses Brampton, Milton, Halton Hills, Caledon, Erin, and more in the Ontario province. You can't help but wonder if they were taken advantage of by the Crown. We pause to remember that First Nations peoples walked this land for thousands of years before the Europeans came here and we acknowledge all the traditional territories on which we stand today. We commit to respectful relationships with our indigenous neighbors, and we accept our responsibility to walk without harming anything. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we thank you for the land that we are on, for the indigenous peoples that were here way before we were. And we ask forgiveness for any wrongs that have been done. As we hear from Lumba and Shadrick today, please open our hearts and our minds and our ears to hear the wonderful work that they are doing in Zambia. I would ask you to bless them both and all those who enter their doors. I would ask that we would always be mindful that there are so many others that don't have wonderful and, and great things that we have here and in Zambia. We would ask that you would be with us today. We ask all of this in your blessed son's name, Christ Jesus, amen. And now I'd like to hand it over to Carol for the UCW welcome. Carol, over to you. Hey, welcome everyone. I'm Carol Dallas Arbuckle and I am the treasurer of National UCW. And as you can see, I'm still stuck in Sydney. Air Canada is doing a really good job of giving me an extra vacation. Our 60th anniversary took Convention, we were at the Member 2 Convention Center on the Member 2 Reserve. And they have welcomed us and we have asked them to join us in our celebration this week. 
and it's been awesome. We have also learned through our Women for Change Zambia that each and every one of you can make change. We don't stand alone, we're never alone, but when we stand side by side, one toony each, it adds up. So never think that anything you do doesn't count because when you stand beside somebody else and they do it, and they stand beside somebody else and they do it, and it just goes on across the country. So I'm really excited for Shadrach to tell, or Luma to tell you how much we have raised for them and the blessing they gave us in letting us know that we matter and we make a difference in the world. So thank you and enjoy this meeting. I'd like thank to invite, you. oh, <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, colleagues. Uh, my name is Jafet in Global for those that, uh, have not yet met me or those that have not yet met. I currently serve as executive minister for the church in mission unit and UCW is anchored within the church in mission unit. So privileged today to welcome my country mates. I was born in Zambia, grew up in Zambia, <laughs> educated both my primary, secondary and my uh, undergraduate in Zambia. So very much Zambian and so glad to see these two wonderful people here and an opportunity to introduce them. Uh, let me start with Lumba Siyanga, uh, as I call her Wolumba. <laughs> Lumba is the current executive director for Women for Change. Lumba served the organization for 14 years before she was uh, appointed to become executive director in 2015. She describes herself as a gender activist, as a feminist, and also as a development practitioner. Lumba has passion for work that touches on marginalized communities, to promote gender equality and fight all forms of poverty. Lumba holds a bachelor's degree in mass communication from the University of Zambia, and she also holds a master's master of arts degree in development studies, specialized in poverty studies, uh, gender and policy analysis, which she did from the International Institute of Social Studies in the Netherlands. So very welcome, very welcome, Volumba, to this uh, uh, platform. And then with her is Shadrick. Shadrick Pembe currently serves as a program monitoring and evaluation manager. Um, Program Monitoring and Evaluation Manager. The boy who started by walking 4.4 miles to school every day and eventually finished his secondary school successfully after skipping one grade in primary school. Uh, Shadrick went on to at, obtain a bachelor's degree in philosophy and he became a teacher. He taught in secondary school. He also taught in post-secondary school. And then he obtained a master's in communication for development. Later on, Shadrick did another master's degree in applied ethics with a focus on environmental and public service ethics. Shadrick is very, very passionate about building capacities for rural communities, especially women and girls, to achieve sustainable development. He's currently enrolled for his PhD program in development studies. Colleagues, you are very welcome. And over to you. The floor is all yours. Women for Change Zambia.
Thank you very much, Reverend, for those um, accolades. Before we get into the presentation, we just want to express our gratitude uh, for having been invited to be part of the celebration 60th anniversary of the UCW. We had a refreshing moment, never to be forgotten, and we'll go back sharing with our colleagues and the people, and especially the children that you support, just to tell them the stories from here and how the women are working very hard to keep our girls and boys in school. So we are grateful for this opportunity. It's once in a lifetime opportunity for us. Ziko Mokwambiri. So I'll just uh, start my uh, presentation with giving, um, by giving a general overview of uh, Zambia and uh, Women for Change. And if time allows, uh, um, Shadrick will then zero in, um, especially on the project that uh, we've been implementing, uh, supported by UCW and uh, United Church of Canada, that is uh, keeping the girls uh, in school. So um, Zambia is located in the southern part of Africa. You can see where that um, arrow is pointing at. It's a small country with a population of about um, 18 million people and um, living below the poverty line. So in comparison to, 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 to Canada, we can say that uh, uh, Zambia is 13 times smaller than uh, Canada. So it's just like a province um, of Canada, slightly larger than Alberta, but uh, smaller than Ontario. So we're a very small country, um, but with um, 17.8 million people, of which 50.48 are females and 49 are males. So we have more females uh, than uh, males. And then um, out of that uh, population, 99.2 million live in rural areas, uh, while the 6.7 million live in um, urban areas of which 53% approximately are under the age of 18. So Zambia is a very youthful country with the majority being young people under the age of uh, 18 years. That's why investing in their future is very key for development uh, to take place and also to break uh, the inequalities that have existed um, over the years uh, between the rural and urban, the young and the old, women and men. We have um, um, a lot of issues around inequality. So for those who've never been to, to Zambia, just to give you a picture, when you come to Zambia, what you be expected to find, uh, Zambia um, has um, um, a number of um, uh, national parks with uh, lots of animals. We have the big five, the buffalo, you can see on that picture, the lions, the leopards, the hippopotamus, the elephants, you find them there. And then Zambia is also home to the Victoria Falls, uh, which we call Mus Otunya or the smoke uh, that thunders. It can be likened to the Niagara Falls um, here. And uh, Zambia is also home to um, a number of ethnic uh, tribes. We have about um, 73 um, ethnic, uh, ethnic groups and we live in harmony uh, since independence, which we got in 1964. And we've passed through various uh, governance uh, systems from being a one-party state 
to a democracy in 1991. And um, yeah, so we, we usually refer to ourselves as one Zambia, one nation living um, um, in diversity and yet united as a diverse uh, people. So uh, Zambia, like um, some parts of the world has two tails um, in terms of uh, inequality. When you go to the urban areas, you will be exposed to um, 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 communities where people have access to education, where people have access to health services, uh, good shelter and so forth. But on the other side, especially in the rural areas and uh, peri-urban areas, you'll find people living in abject uh, poverty and um, uh, very few can even afford to have three meals in a day. They do not have access to education. Children have to walk long distances to school. And, um, and even when they're uh, in school, you find there will be no water, they will have to spend most of the day um, on an empty stomach. So what comes out of there is that there's um, high inequality between the, the two uh, communities. We have children that still learn um, in uh, dilapidated uh, structures and um, while it's in the urban areas, children will have access to uh, some, what we say, good quality education. But in the rural areas, um, the story is usually uh, very, very uh, different. And uh, that's why as Women for Change, we work in the rural areas because we've always felt uh, that's where the need is in order to change uh, people's lives and to contribute uh, to the emancipation of uh, women and girls. Who are we as Women for Change? Uh, women for Change is a gender-based um, organization that was founded by uh, Canadian universities uh, services overseas, which was a Canadian organization implementing uh, various programs in Zambia. And um, we were formed, uh, we came into existence 29 years ago, this year we'll be celebrating uh, half the age of the UCW will be turning 30 years um, in terms of uh, empowering and working with uh, rural women and girls. And we do not forget to carry along uh, um, the vulnerable men and also uh, the boys. So we are currently operating in 28 districts um, out of the 116 uh, districts in Zambia and in six provinces out of um, the 10 uh, provinces uh, in Zambia. Over the years, uh, we have um, helped uh, to um, establish um, a number of uh, community-based uh, organizations. So what is our vision? Our vision is a society that upholds gender equity and equality, leaving no one uh, behind. Our mission is uh, that of a, a gender-focused NGO that builds uh, capacities of rural communities, especially women and girls to achieve sustainable development. What we mean by this is that um, our approaches help the communities to critically analyze uh, the, the problems uh, that they face uh, using uh, especially gender analysis and the popular education methodologies. So we raise awareness on the structural or systematic causes of inequality and uh, marginalization, uh, ma marginalization so that uh, uh, there is more awareness on why we have um, uh, women uh, the way they are, where they are marginalized, excluded uh, from uh, participating uh, in development in terms of economic, social, 
and uh, political, uh, we have very few uh, women um, uh, participating. So our model is that we start from the community, um, build capacities of um, uh, communities to be able to organize themselves, uh, to mobilize, uh, and also to act on issues that um, affect them. So Women for Change is not a membership organization, but we are there to facilitate um, communities to be able to organize themselves into groups. And uh, those groups um, eventually become uh, development um, uh, area associations. Um, and uh, through the area associations, we then empower them to work also with the communities the way Women for Change would do. And some have even graduated to form a district um, uh, area association. So these um, uh, structures um, are free, uh, usually. They are encouraged to uh, have themselves registered as um, community-based organizations uh, so that uh, beyond Women for Change, they are able to stand on their own because that is what Women for Change intends to, to achieve is to ensure that we have communities that are acting on issues that affect them and um, can also have uh, uh, create their own uh, linkages. So when it comes to our thematic um, areas or strategic focus um, in line with um, a strategic plan, uh, that has been running from uh, 2018 uh, to 2022. We have been focusing on climate, uh, building climate, climate, um, engendered uh, climate uh, resilience, uh, where we build capacities of communities. You can see in one picture, uh, uh, communities are meeting to analyze their situation in relation to climate change. Uh, because Zambia has not been left out uh, when it comes to drought. Um, certain communities um, even fail to, you know, uh, to grow their own food, or there could be um, floods in certain communities. So how do um, uh, women and um, uh, communities in general um, uh, build their resilience? So Women for Change especially with the support from United Church of Canada. Um, the past um, uh, five years, we've been raising awareness on uh, uh, climate change uh, so that women are aware and they are able to prepare themselves. So we've trained uh, quite a number of groups in climate uh, smart agriculture um, uh, by encouraging them to grow crops that um, can um, um, survive uh, certain um, uh, climate uh, conditions and also just to empower them economically. Uh, the other uh, strategic objective or thematic area is uh, that um, over the years, um, as we have been implementing, we've noticed that actually uh, gender-based violence has been on the increase in, in Zambia. And uh, uh, this is because of our patriarchal culture, which uh, puts women in um, a subservient uh, position, subordinate uh, position where women cannot voice out uh, around uh, issues to do with participation or they are having control over their resources, the benefits that come out of their work. So there's high uh, GBV. Uh, that is um, um, a gender-based uh, violence. So uh, currently we are implementing um, uh, projects in one of the provinces in Zambia where Women for Change is training um, community leaders to be able to respond to gender-based violence and also to help uh, communities, especially women, to have access to um, justice uh, because of uh, the way we are socialized um, to be silent. Uh, you find that most uh, women and girls, when they, are, they have their rights violated, they cannot voice out. So we 
in, encourage communities to, you know, to uh, raise awareness on the dangers of um, um, gender-based uh, violence. So in the pictures, you can see we've been working very closely with uh, traditional leaders because um, um, uh, gender-based violence can, one of the drivers of uh, gender-based violence is the cultural aspect. So you cannot leave out uh, traditional leaders and also the community uh, communities in terms of uh, prevention of um, uh, gender-based violence by raising awareness. And um, as I said in the beginning, to say that um, uh, women have been sidelined in terms of uh, economic, uh, political, and um, uh, social uh, uh, development. We've also been uh, focusing on um, building women's participation in leadership and decision making so that women are able to voice out, women are able to participate and lead uh, in their communities, not only when it comes to uh, politics, but starting from the household level and um, getting into um, uh, the pol uh, into to politics, while there, we have built their uh, confidence, because um, at the moment, um, uh, women's uh, uh, political participation is actually at the lowest. We only have uh, fifteen point two percent female members of parliament um, against um, that is twenty five against one hundred and thirty five males. Uh, we only have one female out of the 10 provincial ministers and um, um, uh, generally poor women and girls and those with uh, dis disabilities are affected um, the, the, the most and their voices are never heard, even at community level. So Women for Change has been building uh, women's participation in leadership. And um, my uh, colleague, uh, Shadrick, will talk more on the other thematic areas uh, in terms of um, uh, where we are guaranteeing uh, communities where the rights of uh, uh, children and, and especially girls are guaranteed. Because we, in Zambia, uh, despite uh, children being the majority, 59% of children live in poor households, um, um, uh, and uh, children have no access uh, to basic uh, uh, human rights such as education, health. And uh, now we are faced with uh, one of the biggest challenges of uh, uh, children being married off uh, before the age of 18. And uh, this um, sidelines them in, in terms of um, education. We have a high number of girls dropping out of school. Even where a government is uh, providing, for example, now free um, education from uh, um, early childhood to secondary school, you find girls dropping out because of various factors, such as lack of water in schools, uh, uh, menstrual hygiene, and also cultural practices, which put emphasis on uh, marriage other than education. The reason we have very few women also participating in decision making is because we do not uh, meet the criteria when it comes to elections. There's um, um, a, 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 one of the things that, that hinders women to participate is, is that you need to have completed grade 12. Yeah. Um, so we have very few women uh, uh, completing education. So my colleague, uh, Shadrick, will now talk about um, the project that we've been implementing um, with the help of United Church um, uh, Women. Okay, so thank you very much. I think just to say that when you look at uh, talking about the rights of children and especially when you focus on education, it is not just uh, you know, paying for them to be in school. 
because as my colleague has earlier mentioned, there are quite a number of factors that keep girls and even boys from being in school. And it's even worse for the girl because we are in a culture where girls are considered you know, good for marriage, they are good for the kitchen. And so investing in the education is seen as a waste because after all, she will just be married off and be with her husband and do not benefit anything. But also that um, for a girl, they think even if we don't educate her, at least if she's like she's a, you know, married to a man who can afford to look after her, she'll be okay. So you see a lot of focus being on girls. So when we look at supporting girls' education, we are not just looking at the girl in school, but we're also looking at what is the environment like. So for example, what you see in the bottom picture, this is a role play where they are actually trying to portray what is happening in the community. So that girl and that boy, they are, they are planning to get married and they're being encouraged by the community. But then they are trying to analyze what benefits are we going to get? Okay, maybe it would be nice when we, when we get in. What about when this don't, you know, these things don't work out? So it is a holistic approach where we look at the community in general. Is the girl in a safe environment? Are the community leaders, are the parents, are the teachers being supportive? I mean, if you look at the picture on top there, such a young girl holding another child. These two are supposed to be children, but one of them is now a parent, it's a mother. And now culture cannot be two. Once you are a mother, you are a father, you are an adult. So they treat you as an adult, they take it to look after yourself. And this is what leads to a lot of poverty. And so when we talk about the support that we are getting from United Church Women, this is why we appreciate. I think, like I said during the conference, yes, here we have the number 44 of the children that we are supporting. And when you look at the population, a country that has more than half being young people, we don't want to talk about percentages. This would be a drop in the ocean. But like I said, it's not really about the number. It's about the kind of change that, you know, this support brings to a girl. You know, when you look at these girls in the picture, we are talking about rural areas where a girl only knows about a teacher, a nurse, and a police officer. So it's not uncommon when you ask them, what do you want to become to say, I want to be a teacher. So we do a number of things. You see the girl you know, top left, she is sitting in the speaker's chair in Lusaka. So this is one of the programs that we, we've gotten a lot of support, including from UCC where we bring these girls and boys to expose them to life beyond what they see in the village. So she sits there and she's like, oh, so I can actually be more than what I see in my community. So the support we got from the UCC, it had to be more than just paying for them. These girls are coming from poor households. A number of them, most of them have no shoes. They are very, very bad looking clothes. So even when you pay for them and they go to school, you find they cannot concentrate. Their friends are mocking them, they are laughing at them. They just don't fit. And so to get them to be comfortable, it has to be more than just school fees. So you see on the pictures, and some of you may have seen these pictures, you buy them a trunk to keep their clothes safe. I mean, just a lockable system, a mattress where to sleep, the uniform. And now when they are dressed like this and they feel confident, then you can tell them go to school and they are very happy to be in school. So really, this support when you look at it, look at it more from the, the, the way the hearts of the girls are filled with joy, knowing that now they have dignity, they have hope. And these are the girls that you see. There are quite a number of successes that we can talk about. I mean, if we talk about women, we have seen women being able to, you know, for example, the picture on top there, top right. These are women in a remote village, three hours, from, from a small town in Southern province. And now with our capacity building, they've been able to process a number of raw materials and make money. So they are producing oils, clothes, uniforms for their children, and they're very happy. And what you see number two from left on the picture, that's a chief actually, chief Chikanda. And she's amazed at the kind of work being done. And she's like, wow, this is what I want in my chief dome. We have seen, you know, the picture at the bottom there, a woman of 25, you know, producing off and on and off season crops. So what you see there are butternuts and they're able to make about $7,000 in three months, four months. 
Now that may seem very small for you because obviously you say ah, 7,000 divided by 25, but these are women who work for the whole year and all they can do is produce a few bags to eat. And now they have money and they can make decisions and they feel very encouraged and very empowered. So really, we, this work that you, you do for us, the support that you give, believe you me, it, girl, it gives girls dignity. It gives them hope. Girls all of a sudden feel they can make choices in life because the choice is not only marriage and forced marriage for that matter. I mean, I was giving a few examples in the conference. Look at this picture, for example. So if you look at on the right, this is Gwendolyn, one of the girls that the UCW that you are supporting. And so the next picture, we are going from right to left. That's a bathroom. So basically, oh, that's where you take a bath. You can compare the, the bathrooms that we are, we know. And the next picture, that is basically a homestead. So on the last picture on the left, the, in the extreme left, those are the parents of Gwendolyn. They are basically peasant farmers. They have about two chickens, you know, with a few chicks around. And when Gwendolyn passed, Unfortunately, before she even wrote the exam, she fell pregnant at the age of 13. So 13 years, she's pregnant. And in our village, I'm sure our Reverend Njovi, you do remember even now that when a girl was pregnant, rather than feeling sorry for her, rather than worrying about the health complications that could come with the pregnancy, she gets a lot of, you know, it's, it's basically punishment. She's blamed for falling pregnant, she is told, now you are an adult, you are pushing into marriage. And so this girl, Gwendolyn, that you see on the picture, was about to be sent into marriage. And because this happened before writing a grade nine examinations, it means she was not going to write the exam. But thank God, with your work, we had already started engaging. And when we heard about it, we moved in. And before we realized it, Gwendolyn could not be pushed into marriage. So she was allowed to, to go home when the pregnancy was, was really big and she couldn't afford to go to, I mean, she couldn't manage to go to school. But when it was time for exams, she wrote her exams, she passed and she was one of the best students at school. So she went to a secondary school. So what you see in the picture is our staff holding her baby. So the, the, the mother now is looking after the child of her child. So the mother and father are now looking after their grandchild and Gwendolyn is in school. She's very happy and she says she's going to do her best. She learned lessons from this experience. We can show you another picture. This is another girl that is uh, from a simple village. And she passed, came with her acceptance letter because when you write grade nine examinations, they write to you whether you have been accepted to go to the next grade or not. So she came with the letter very excited and they told her, so what? And she's like, oh my goodness. I've passed, I'm supposed to go to grade 10 and the parents were very clear they could not afford and there's no way they're going to continue spending one of them, no money. So she was quite sad, you know, to, to get that kind of reaction. I mean, any girl would not want to be in the position of Caroline. You've achieved something in life and you think now of hope and they just tell you, just keep quiet. I think you get into marriage. So before she realized it, one day she's sitting and then two older men come. She's not even consulted. They have a discussion with the parents and then they go. And then she's asking, who are those men that came and she is told one of those is going to be your husband. She's like, what? Fortunately, again, we heard about the story and we, we, we can't go into details. The girl is now in school. Those men, unfortunately, were disappointed. They couldn't come back to marry her because we cannot allow that situation to happen to this girl. So she's very, very happy. And she says, without the UCW, I don't know what my life would have been. Of course, we don't only support girls. We also have boys that have serious issues, serious challenges. An example of Sipo that you see in the picture, whose father went to, we call them now correctional facilities, but normally they the language is prison. So the father went to a correctional facility when, when he was only five and the mother struggled to support him. And because he had to walk over six miles from school, he couldn't manage because you can see as a condition of kyphosis and also he lost one arm. 
So eventually he shifted to an aunt nearby, but it was very tough for him because the aunt also can hardly even manage to feed her own children. So to have an extra, you know, an extra child, it was not easy. And unfortunately, the aunt even passed, you know, passed on last year. May I so rest in peace. But this boy is one of the boys that has been blessed with hope because now she has assured, I mean, he has assurance that he's going to be in school until he completes grade 12. So there are quite a number of stories that we can share. And for us, when you talk about supporting a girl, this is the joy that we get. Look at the left picture. This is Faith Musateka, one of the girls we've supported. Look at her in the village, looking quite happy, but quite simple. We put her in university. And when you look at her now, the right picture, look at the confidence, the way she looks. She goes back to her village and she's like, wow. So girls like her now have an opportunity to see it is possible for a girl to move from this condition to that condition. You see, Betha, look at her on the left-hand side, looking a bit fearful and not too much hope when we found her in the village. But now there she is, she's a graduate, just graduated from the University of Zambia. And look at the confidence, look at the smile on her face. So this is the kind of work that you are actually doing. So really, you may not realize it, but the, the smiles you are causing, the hope that you are bringing, the life you are changing is something that we cannot measure in numbers. So thank you so much, Reverend. I think I went here, but we cannot stop saying thank you so, so much to UCC and UCW. The work you are doing is changing lives and we are happy to part of this story. Thank you very much. Wow, thank you very much, uh, Shadrick and Walumba for that presentation and for those stories of success regarding the program that UCW has been supporting and for situating for us the context of UC, I mean, Women for Change and uh, the priorities that the organization focuses on. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I see that in the chat, somebody has commented something regarding style of clothes. And I think it was uh, to do, maybe if you could make a comment on the uniforms, you know, uniforms in Zambia, she calls them, uh, Caroline calls them, uh, Western culture style clothes. <laughs> Just talk about how helpful uniforms have been in the education system in Zambia. That's right. We have had a serious debate about whether we should continue with what you could call the British style, because obviously Zambia was colonized by Britain and uh, a number of things, including today that we learn about in the education system are very much influenced by the British you know, way of thinking. But a uniform is one such thing that even though it's foreign, we think it's from outside, it has proved to be very useful for the children. Because if you look at even the students that we are, we are supporting, they are in a school where they are coming from different families like my colleague mentioned, you have families that are doing very well and they can manage to you know, buy their children very nice shoes, very nice you know, clothes, and they change every day. So every day you practically a different skate and different shirt. But there are also children that may have a nice, one nice skate and a shirt. And believe me, I'm not exaggerating, they wash the same shirt every day to wear it. So what they do is that they put on the shirt, they go to school, I mean, they have to walk for some distance, come back in a sweaty shirt. They have to wash it while they are sleeping so that it dries. I mean, they wash it. The following morning is like that. And before they realize it, they actually even given names. So their names like, oh, it's a, the one. You know, this one has only one cloth. It's same color, things like that. So girls actually get mocked for putting on the same shirt while the other one you know, can change every day. So just having... You know, only one pair of, for example, you know, trousers gets you so uncomfortable that even when they are paid for everything else, you see girls failing to go to school. And sometimes they cannot even tell you why. So a uniform is such an important thing because at least if a girl has two, you know, two pairs of a uniform, even if they wash every two days, when they are in school, they look the same. 
So because of that, the issue of, you know, people saying, oh, you have one claw, oh, you have one shit and things like that. They all kind of feel equal. It's already one step that helps them to feel equal and then they concentrate on school. And I should mention that goes beyond the uniform. Actually, it has come to a stage where even the hairstyle is regulated because you don't want some children to come with all these fancy hairstyles and the others can only manage what we call mukule. You know, there's something that they do to just keep the hair together. So there are all those things that are being done to help just while in school to make sure everybody looks the same and so they concentrate on school. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Wachembe. Uh, indeed, just in addition on the on the yeah. uniforms. Go ahead. Uh, just to share that some of the school uniforms are actually more expensive than the school fees themselves. Like uh, right now, uh, government has the policy of free education, so it means um, uh, children are not paying the school fees, but they have to buy their own uniform, which usually is um, very expensive and most um, uh, children in the rural areas, especially at secondary uh, school level, uh, the uniforms are quite expensive and they may not afford. So Women for Change also comes in with the support of the UCW to ensure that uh, the girls' uniforms are purchased and they are not um, excluded. Thank you. I also thought that you would comment on the fact that uniforms has a way of equalizing equalizing the situation for those that yes. attend schools rather mm -hmm. than children coming with their home clothes because then it creates competition in the school. Yeah. And so uniforms yeah. have a way in which all pupils in school look the same, dress the same, and therefore no competition. That's that's Definitely. I thought you would mention that one important thing about the value of uniforms yes. as compared to wearing their own cultural yes. clothes as you had put them or as the system is in some of the schools here in Canada where children go with their own chosen clothes. If they did that in the Zambian setting, it would be another demotivator to mm -hmm. the children in school. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dennis says, thank you so much. I visited Zambia 14 years ago to visit Women for Change Rural Projects. It's so wonderful to see you continue to work for the rights of rural villagers and especially girls. I was inspired by your motto of men and women working together. I continue to be inspired by the wonderful smiles I see in the students whose lives you have changed. God bless you and your continuing work in Zambia. And Caro, Caro would like to make a comment on behalf of UCW. Yes, I would. I know we were able to present a check for $103,000 over that this year or this celebration. But this coming September, we will choose a new special project for the next five years. But Women for Change Zambia is a global partner of the United Church of Canada. So as I remind every UCW woman, every time we change our special project, when you have that special feeling in your heart that I still want to support them, you can, through mission and service, put Women for Change Zambia, UCW, and send it to the philanthropy department and we can continue to support them every year when you're choosing who you're going to give your charitable donations to. Women for Change Zambia should be on that list somewhere. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Thank you, thank Carol, you. for those comments. Thank you. Do we have any last comment before we conclude our gathering? Oh, my goodness. Time is not with us. This has been so enriching, so wonderful. A lot of information, of course, uh, from Women for Change in terms of those uh, areas they focus on, and then this program on scholarship and support to change the lives of girls and some vulnerable boys. Any last comment? No, I don't see a hand up. I don't see a comment in the chat. 
Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, there's Caroline who says, thank you for your comments, but as I understand, the one of indigenous people in Canada, ribbon skates, maybe something could be paid for and include that would make them proud to be unified. Wow, maybe, Caroline, I'm not sure that you would exactly compare the indigenous ribbon skates <laughs> to the situation in Zambia, but thank you for your comments. Uh, over to you, Karen, for, oh, is it is it Laurie for conclusions? Uh, Karen's next, thanks. Karen is next. <laughs> Are you there, Karen? You mean? Yes, I'm here, yourself? sorry. Wonderful, thank you. I'm just gonna share the... Uh, Does everybody see that? Yes. Now, I just wanted to tell you that I want to thank all of you, the UCW, for all your support. I did do an update. So the total is a little bit more. It was only 90,000 from the UC, not only, but the UCW Women for Change was 90,000 and change. And now, um, as of Friday, this past Friday, yesterday, uh, it's 94,544.99. So it is um, now up to 107,644.49. And as Carol so eloquently said, thank you, Carol, um, you can give through the United Church of Canada, uh, the website for the giftwithvision.ca, and there are uh, women for change op opportunities there that you can give through, or you can send a check to the United Church and just put uh, in the memo line area, women for change, WFC, if you'd like, for Zambia. And we would be uh, putting it through mission and service to uh, Zambia. So thank you so much. It's amazing the work that um, is being done. And I just wanted to thank you all and I hope to continue hearing from you and from uh, Zumba and uh, Shadrach on all the great things and the blessings that they're receiving. Thank you. Thank you very much. The pleasure is ours. And, and to in, in vain to close, I think we've been reminded today of what is possible when we work together. With the 60th anniversary, UCW reminds us, let us continue in hope. The way is long. I'll invite Lumba to share this prayer with me. The way is long. Let us go together. The way is difficult. Let us help each other. The way is joyful. Let, Let us, us share. share it. The way is ours alone. Let, Let us, us go, go in love. love. The way grows before us. Let, Let us, us begin. begin. Amen. Amen.